manipulation. I remember the day the world became an archive. I remember that day in every detail. I mean, of course I did. The driver had picked us up at Milano Centrale. Uh, we drove up direction Ispra, past the Lago Maggiore, through the autumn forest. It was fucking freezing. I mean, far too cold for that time of year. The ashes of Mount Vesuvius were still turning the leaves the color of an old family photo album, while um, the particles in the air made for quite a spectacular sunrise, somewhere in between Bikini Atoll and Turnipend. After a scenic drive of about 90 minutes, half an hour, we entered the European Commission's research compound through the Western Gate. We showed our passports and were guided in. Franck, uh, the head of the in-house department for virtual and augmented reality, who had hired us, explained that around 3,000 scientists worked currently in the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, that this was basically Silicon Valley but without investors. Originally founded to provide the European Commission with the necessary research and the basic knowledge um, to inform their future policies and legislation. The JRC had invited my colleague Ben and me uh, to write near future scenarios for their new visitor center um, based on their scientists' research on deforestation and its effects on planetary ecology including the ongoing great extinction of species. It's always a bit weird to see yourself as a hologram. Uh, back in the day, those doppelganger motifs would be, you know, would mean instant death, I think. But what was even more weird was uh, that whole job that we got ourselves into. I mean, how do you tell a positive story about the climate catastrophe uh, it became clear rather quickly that everybody that was on board was rather depressed by talking about the near future, even just thinking about it, and that all the scientists had basically lost hope that a climate catastrophe could be avoided. Uh, funny side note, the Disney composer who was hired to do the soundtrack uh, left after a couple of hours and said he couldn't do the job. Um, but what was more worrying maybe was that uh, was not only the loss of faith in, in um, that a climate catastrophe could be avoided, but also the loss of faith in all those simulation models um, that uh, the climate research had been based on for the last decades. Uh, basically, last year's results had exploded uh, the charts to an extent that um, they were simply, the results were simply not valid anymore. Nobody really knew what to do as a good scientist. That is the moment you gotta stop working. But nobody wanted to lie, at least not that fundamentally, but nobody really wanted to tell the truth either. Inhabitation, model, and interaction. And these sort of center around a really even naive question that is to say, you know, what do we mean when we say the planetary? What are we, what are we evoking with, with that concept? And I think for me, it's really helpfully illustrated by uh, the thinking of Deepesh Chakrabarti, a historian, who basically said that, you know, the domain of history as we've come to understand it has come to an end, right? And by that, he means that the domain of history understood as the narration or debate among strictly interhuman affairs um, that we've come to know from modernity through to globalization has come to an end. And that is because in that particular understanding of history, right, Earth is but an inert, you know, an inert backdrop for human affairs, right? So human affairs are centered, the Earth is just a passive resource. Um, and what we've come to see quite brutally and frontally with something like climate catastrophe is that, in fact, that has never been the case, right? And if certainly many human cultures have known and practiced their forms of life with that recognition. I thought we were talking about the future, sorry. But um, you might want to talk about history, I don't get it. My dear friend, Marion, the future and history the future or history are not opposites. So I think the general bond that we're going to be talking about a lot tonight concerns the important influence of narration upon human life worlds in our triumphs, in our banalities, and yes, in our atrocities. 
And to this end, the polymath Sylvia Winter has named us as Homo Narans, that is hybrid, biophysical, and storytelling creatures who auto-institute their socio-technical life worlds. And at this historical moment, we can now recognize ourselves in a planetary historical epoch. Does that answer your question? I'm not really sure because I think I do not really understand what you mean when you talk about the planetary. Right, well I think what the planetary reveals to us are basically the real consequences of those artificial narrations upon Earth systems. As these narrations have manifest in complex technological externalizations that intervene in the very Earth system sustaining the very possibility of human life. So what the planetary sort of compels is a facing up to an unprecedented historical material condition that requires us to practice coexistence in an environment in common, no matter how differentially it is inhabited. And I think this, the uncertainty of this moment sort of marks a juncture between two historical worlds or two historical epochs. So the unprecedented planetary forms of life that are now being invented, so planetary forms of life to come, and the end of a world as it's been known uh, through the frameworks of Euro modernity and all of its Janus faced realities. No, I'm not one with the Nazi, the Zionist, the misogynist, the cracker. I'm a black, proud female poet. Black, huh? I just turned black, huh? We live. It's our human gift. By returning to one as we die. And I know that's what you want to see. White privilege of philosophizing. What others are lacking and dying. And slave is a new, with modern materialistic views. So fuck your ego, fuck your fame, fuck your schools. And all they do is reach imperialistic foes. Peace, love, and silence. Institutional alliance. Yes, we can't fuck your God. Yeah. Semantics is always a bitch, yeah. Uh, and it goes on and on into eternity. Yeah. My place of birth is called underdeveloped. You like it's far beyond reach. reach. It's far beyond reach. We find ourselves at the threshold of a new era, one characterized by indeterminacy. It's a time marked by high-end climate consciousness, political conflict, and the disruptive influence of digital technologies. Yet amidst this tumult, we witness not just uncertainty, but also a virtual ground for political experimentation, jurisdictional design, and novel modes of governance. Sovereignty is being distributed power decentralized. The horizon of possibility expands, inviting us to reimagine the very essence of governance, from hierarchical structures to collaborative modes of commoning. How do we reconcile legal frameworks rooted in sovereign states with the emergent realities of decentralization? Can we conceive of a decentralized right to breathe, one that addresses the nuanced injustices inherent in every breath while acknowledging its intrinsic value. And amidst this boundless potential lies the inherent duality of indeterminacy. It's both a source of opportunity, but also a harbinger of risk. Merely critiquing the status quo, as Brian Masumi contends, falls short of our imperative to creatively engage with the emergent possibilities, mobilizing our complicity towards novel configurations and an appreciation of diversity and difference.
Hey, Daniela. I had a question about, um, I was really intrigued by your notion of breath, and maybe we can try to see breath as a kind of new vehicle to consider governance that is quite radically different from how it has been organized so far uh, in terms of governance being attached to territorial models. And here, of course, I'm thinking of the work of Achille Membe, who I know you've recently spoke with, who uh, you know both links the the sort of um, I can't breathe from the Black Lives Matter protest through to you know the politics or the the right to breathe as in air pollution. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the right to breathe may be a new vehicle to consider governance at a planetary dimension. Yes, um, thank you. I mean, it is difficult to think about more just modes of law and governance on a heating planet with ever more rigid borders. So thinking with and through breath, thinking with and through the atmosphere, through every single breath, human and more than human, and each entangled with the others, shows us the limits and flaws of our, our, our Western legal systems. So we wonder, can we collectively and across differences work towards a decentralized concept of entangled and more than human rights? And if so, and I think that's important, where does that power come from and how is it distributed? Another question that would be interesting is the question of atmospheres here, no? Because if the atmosphere changes, it seems that um, the existence within it uh, changes as well massively in the practices and what they mean. Breathing would become something completely different if uh, we had to think about it on Mars, wouldn't it? Yes, yes it would, and in effect, um, the, the idea of working on a decentralized right to breathe comes from outer space literature that imagines oxygen factories and the com um, commodification of oxygen. So I think the question of atmosphere is very, very fundamental. The universal human body as a model is more uncertain than ever before. We stand on the shore of the future amidst a multitude of prosthetic bodies, animal bodies, cyborg bodies, pornographic, mutated and torturable bodies, disabled, migrated and colonized bodies, flying, scurrying and crawling bodies. The point, however, is to readjust our perspective away from the dubious paradise of some pre-modernity. Better, redirect our attention to the non-innocent reality of the present time to imagine other futures. I want to propose cohabitation in the sense of living with others. Cohabitation is a lived exploration of solidarity as a tenderness of species. Cohabitation, uh, of course, produces a certain kind of uncertainty. Wouldn't you agree, Daniela? Yes, I would agree. And I think that we are trained or we are taught from early on that we are born in a pre-existing pre world with pre-existing space uh, across a linear temporality and causality. I think that this was, this was proven wrong already by science. I think that I would like to think with the idea of indeterminacy, which would mean a different responsibility of what it means to live with each other and on a shared planet. Yeah, I'd like to just raise a slight problem potentially. You mentioned entanglement recently, and this term indeterminacy, at least it's familiar to me more from like a quantum mechanics sort of realm. And I'm really, I'm a bit worried about importing tropes or discoveries in the physical world upon systems of governance, right? Because it's also been a, uh, this kind of problem of a natural fallacy of, of importing things like entanglement and assuming they have some kind of moral predisposition upon our artificially constructed worlds. I was wondering if you had considered this, Fahim. Uh, not exactly, like I'm also not an expert in quantum mechanics and questions of entanglement, but I would, in defense of this uh, position, would argue that at least in the left, it was traditionally like that, that um, like in, in manifestos, doesn't matter if it's a communist manifesto or the cyborg manifesto, that you detect parts of reality that you consider good and progressive and you concentrate and focus on that. 
And I think this is a materialist perspective on the world, not just great ideas. Thomas, what do you think? I agree. I mean, one of the tricky things is that there's no shortcut to politics. Um, and all of our ontologies, whether they be based in quantum physics or elsewhere, they're all historical. I mean, themselves are all practices, performances that we engage in, that we make. Um, and there's no shortcut to the experimental process. Just because everything's in relation doesn't mean everything's going to turn out okay. In corporeal turbulence, space is born and time. No big bang, no big chill, no stasis, no power, no hierarchies, no essence, no God, no deity. No Big Bang, no Big Chill, no stasis, no power, no hierarchies, no essence, no God, no deities. Only quantum indeterminacy, history, order, and habits arise. History, history and, and habits arise. History, story, order, and habits arise. From spontaneous, 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 vanish below the surface of presence, presence, presence. Soon saturated day fold up and vanish below the surface of presence as to all things as to all things as to all things as to all things as to all 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 things as to all as to all as to all, as to all, as to all, as to all things. Embodied experience matters. Imagination matters. Details matter. Slowed time and multidimensional awareness matters. Cultivating a relationship with the unknown is key. Transport yourself into the body, sensorium and liquid environment of a common octopus. This involves becoming protean, incoherent, experimental and plastic, prioritizing the senses of touch and taste, becoming a plural entity, navigating multiple perspectives, generated by an intelligence embodied in eight arms and a central brain simultaneously flowing the outside through the insides and camouflaging the body to become the surfaces you move over. What kinds of experience, bodies, perception and connection might be revealed in the process? Maggie. Hi. So this question about atmospheres, um, maybe rather environments or ecologies, is that something that resounds with what you do when you communicate or with the octopus? Um, I think one of the reasons I was really drawn to 
trying to spend a lot of time in the ocean uh, working out what the octopus's relationship to an in its environment was. It's so intimate uh, and like most creatures, unlike us, uh, it's 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 completely attuned to what's going on around it and i think to be uh in cohabitation and uh with other life forms on the planet which is part of the conversation that's been happening so far i think there needs to be loads less of us and we need to consume a lot less and give much more space to other forms of life, like any ecosystem that you you kind of intrude on that is not usually ours, which is I think what attracted me about the ocean. I'm, I'm a kind of outsider there and I'm a clumsy outsider who can't stay very long. But watching all the interactions and um, in the area I was in, in Cape Town, where there's a still very biodiverse, um, hugely brilliant uh, great sea forest you can see what things would be like with with less of us <laughs> uh, yeah that's really all, what I think about cohabitation Juliana is there anything you have to add to cohabitation so I have spent decades trying to coincide with the macroscopic manifestations of a microscopic organism that lives mostly out of sight. I work for the fungi, and most fungi, many of them, form mycelium. An invisible, apparently invisible, microscopic structure that extends through soil, through forest, through tree trunks, through a series of substrates, and only once, maybe a year, or twice a year, or once every 10 years, conforms to form a macroscopic structure that we can coincide with, but we co-inhabit all the time. Every step we take is in cohabitation with these organisms, that we can't see them, or they that they don't show themselves, is another question. And I would like to add something. When we're talking about atmosphere, I think it's important not to forget those who don't have a right to breathe. I'm speaking about, for example, Afghanistan. Kabul, there's something called the Kabul calf, the Kabul husten. When you're three days in Kabul, you, have, you, you start bleeding from the nose and have to calf a lot. And that's because 20 years of war there, war of the West, have left uh, this country ruined, both the air and the ground. And I also want to remind us all about the colonial legacies of the atmosphere. When a lot of countries were decolonized and freed themselves in the 50s, one thing wasn't freed, that was the atmosphere. The air above the ground was still part of the colonial framework for decades and decades after that. creates a relationship between an inside and an outside, between one scale and another. The first century BCE Roman poet Lucretius wrote that the nature of things depends entirely on their flexa foramina, or tortuous pores. For example, he says lightning and sound can move through the pores of a wall. Sights and tastes travel through the pores of our bodies. Air and water pool up into sea and sky because they leak out of the earth like milk through breasts. Everything weaves through everything else, depending on the size and shape of pores. Skin appears flat and smooth to the eye and hand, but it is woven from nested layers of openings. What appears smooth at one scale is filled with holes on another, all the way down 
to the quantum vacuum of indeterminate fluctuations. Thus the insides of our bodies are fully continuous with the outside. The interior is the exterior. And yet pores are not things. The Latin word foro literally refers to a process of boring or hollowing out. But every hollow is in turn hollowed out with more hollows, like a recursive fractal pattern across scales. The pores of things are like so many eyes, ears, mouths, noses, and orifices that draw in a pool or flow through their opening and make possible a specific regime of sensation, affect, and touch through their folds. All the bodies of the world are like Sierpinski's sponge, fractal patterns with infinite surface area and zero volume. The world has no substance, only processes of passage, nothing but pores. I've dedicated my life to studying fungi, a group of organisms that are neither plants nor animals, but that form a kingdom or queendom of their own. I spend a lot of time exploring the similarities between the process of creating and finding. In both of those processes, it's fundamental to have a state of receptiveness or openness to an encounter. When we are out in the wild looking for species, we also have to have a state of openness or receptiveness to an encounter and follow energies that might take us in different directions than the ones that we have pre-established. So how easy is it to distinguish between an inside and an outside of a mycelium network? Juliana. Well, fungi are organisms that live inside their food, contrary to us who have food outside of our bodies. So the duality between the ways we live and the way that we understand um, our environment are completely different. Um, there is no difference between the outside and the inside in fungal life because they, they graphically demonstrate that no one is without another. Individuals don't exist, and fungi graphically show that by being immersed in the others that they depend on. And what would an octopus tell us about pores and insides and outsides, Maggie? Also, if going back to what Thomas was saying about pores while Maggie joins us, um, the word in Spanish for fungus is hongo, which comes from spongos, which comes from sponge, which comes from pores. Yes, that's perfect. Um, there's no inside or outside, I think, for offices, and both of your um, beautiful talks have I think expressed it's like as if an octopus I saw this thing once of uh, as if an octopus was everywhere in the world and we wouldn't know that because it camouflages it 
itself on everything like a kind of protein skin so it becomes it's the surfaces of everything it's moving over all the time so I can't tell if everything's in fact octopuses <laughs> but um there, there's a yeah I think I think also something we've lost as in the west or in the 300 years of colonial enlightenment thinking is that what Thomas is talking about is a way of being with each other, all kinds of being, in, and that is what earlier or like wiser, more integrated animist cultures know. Now, and we we've lost like if we if I tried to live what Thomas's um, poetics speech about pause show. Um, indicates I would be in a really heightened and different state of awareness and much more like an octopus in its in my processing of everything in the world around me. Yeah. So, um, and Thomas, would you say that the conditions we live in or under or with, uh, they, uh, that we are a lot closer to mycelium or fungi or octopus than we might think? Yeah, I would say that, but it's tricky because we live in a state, I think Maggie said it before, I mean, of kind of constant performative contradiction. <clears throat> Millions of years, we've evolved these hypersensitive organisms, you know, our bodies, um, our nervous system. We really are or can be um, deeply, deeply connected to all the things around us and very much continuous with those fungal pores and octopus feeling but we live in a world which constantly tries to cover that up, you know, with walls and cement and colors and uniform patterns. We've really, by destroying so much of nature, we've lost huge amounts of these iterative fractal patterns um, that used to shape our consciousness. And now we do our best um, in industrial civilization to pretend like that natural world doesn't exist that we don't have to be attuned to it in the same way. Um, and as a side note, I do wonder sometimes if just over the course of from the ancient world to the present, that neuroplasticity has in some ways rewired our brains to be significantly desensitized to the vast majority of the world. Also the kind of temporality we live in has done that. Like we live in a much more mono temporality of unless we make a big effort. In a temporality. Hey. Say again. We live in a temporality. Never made the grade. This world is shrinking, greatness on decline. Lost in our own heads, missing in every sign. Asking who gon' lead when we love us the least. Looking in this to say, be nature a leash. Top of dollars, dreams, mama said, be free. Got to stay away. We all do this together. Thank you. 
face is life's intricate signs Every fault the mystery behind Yeah, yeah, a sign Chess is twisted intertwined is found through every bridge, every valley. We on that profound quest, yeah. After the cosmos, we seek, we, we test, minds, creases deep. Yeah, listen. Earth breathes to its pulse and binds and twine. <sighs> History's chime, wrinkles you, in time. History's chime in every gap, every pore, I hid and dime. Living in the By spatially separating the production and the consumption of animal, capitalist modernity created cultural architectures of mass misery on industrial scale. But urbanization also alienated and debrutalized part of the population from archaic interspecies violence. Such non-innocent and unfinished processes resulting from the rapid urbanization of animals and humans resound in contemporary debates. Yet we profoundly lack the concepts to be able to grasp and articulate the extent and nature of the presence of animals in this world. We need to find more imaginative languages, more apt images, and more inspiring models that help us to better perceive and understand this new world in which we have long been living. Cohabitation does not prove that another world is possible, but that a thousand other worlds exist. Yes, but it also opens up a paradox. These worlds exist, but they also need to be brought into being. And they need to be brought into being by opening up towards other species, not just for connection and entanglement, but for a very precise goal, for increasing others' autonomy. And this poses a difficult challenge for Western thinking that for science and technology has always been about prediction and about control. But we have to realize that we are not in control of this shared destiny and that our agency should not increase necessarily the control over others. So what we uh, need to acquire is a new type of mastery, the mastery of non-mastery. I couldn't agree more. And we heard um, a lot of things today. Some of them I couldn't agree entirely, like some depopulation where too many humans on the planet. I don't believe in it all. We should consume less. I really don't think that this in any way, this is the important point, but, but I think, both what you said, but also what Maggie said at, uh, at the beginning, I think it's important that we, we try to cultivate relations to the unknown. And what uh, that could mean in a, in a city, for example, not, not, only, uh, not only underwater, is to embrace also unintended landscapes as a form of encounter with nature, but that was not designed by somebody specific. For me, this so to speak, wild commons of urban nature are something in space that could be compared to something in time, free time, in the sense that this is an area of life that it's not just bulldozed by ideas of profit maximization and so on. And every space like that, every unintended landscape is also a habitat, a potentiality of other forms of sociality non-capitalist, anti-capitalist, or whatsoever. So there is also a potential in that what we don't know.
The rewilded northern bald ibis flies not only through the air, but also through data. About 90% of them are carrying a tracking device, an off-the-shelf model that costs about 900 euros, plus an ongoing data plan for connectivity. It is powered by a battery with a sonar panel and gets its location from a GPS unit, about one point every 10 minutes of the bird's waking time. The data is sent back over the cell phone network. As a low-flying bird living in densely populated area, reception is usually not a problem. Once mature, the bird itself becomes a continuous source of data production. The tracking device records GPS position, acceleration data and temperature. In the age of datafication, this information goes beyond providing real-time bird location. Through extensive algorithmic analysis, these data points enable new forms of interpretation. Calculating daily distances and direction vectors allows the detection of the auto migration, revealing a notable shift of almost 30 days within the last decade. The bird's data can serve as a sentinel for detecting climatic changes in its migration patterns. It even unveils the coverage of outdated mobile phone antennas through old tracking devices. Thus, the bird is not only being watched, but it also watches a decaying network infrastructure. But the data not only feeds the support and care by the project team and the network of dedicated volunteers, it also feeds an app, the Animal Track. It renders tracking data on a map, allowing users to follow an individual bird through space and upload data from their own encounters. This creates an effective connection between the public and the animals, now seen as individuals with unique names, personal quirks, and singular histories. Bird managers and enthusiasts, including those using the Animal Tracker app, keep constant vigilance over bird movements. While this may be considered surveillance, what these collective efforts also constitute is a form of care. And this prompts the question, how does one care for a rewilded species? So what is this? Yeah. If I understand correctly, it's technology as care or management as care or technological management as care. I'm not sure I understand. If you approach this from the point of view of technology, then there's no difference from a tracker that a wild animal is carrying to an anklet praise that a prisoner is carrying. This is a surveillance device. The difference comes from the social or more than social relationship that this device is embedded into and the general purpose for why these relationships are created. While in the surveillance case, the purpose of the relationship is repression and control, in, in this case, the purpose of the technology is to increase autonomy and to allow for a relatively free way of living. But I think also that another um, opportunity or role of tech can play in here, um, and which is actually contrary to the usual data, very extractivist method of, you know, like get, just getting more data, getting bigger models. But here actually with this project, you, you can also see that actually there is a certain phase where tech is needed. Um, to, but the ultimate goal is not to scale up, actually, but actually on the contrary, the goal is actually to scale down the technology. I would like to propose that care is an interaction, and in this case, what does the bird care for the human's care? And in a scenario of surveillance, which I very much resonate with, where does care come in as an interaction? I do have the feeling sometimes in my more cynical moments that there is a weird correlation between uh, our communication with biological systems and our communication with uh, technological systems. We uh, do not really understand the language the other one is speaking in, and we gap that bridge uh, with um, a lot of practices, techniques, technologies, or with illusions and stories that try to help us over. 
But last time we talked, I think you told me that there is a difference and that it's not like that for biological systems. In biological systems, one interprets what one is hearing or seeing from an anthropic point of view. How dare we interpret what a non-human is um, receiving from our communication? I think that it's important to stay in our place of how we are interpreting from where we stand and what we've learned, and to insinuate that we are hearing what a non-human wants to say. Um, in some cases, through domestication, we've learned that through trial and error. We know that when a dog growls and, and shows its teeth, it might bite us. But with other non-humans that we haven't domesticated, we need to be very careful at interpreting that um, in a definitive way. There's also, absolutely, there's also uh, something I've been thinking, we've been thinking about right. in my art collective, or from Drift, that to try and train a machine learning algorithm on 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 the behaviours of an octopus in its environment, or octopuses in um, ocean environment, and kind of cut the humans out, other than as facilitators of the technology, etc. And to want to then think, would we understand any kind of meaning of communication between the two, or if there was any, or would we understand that? Like, our sense of meaning would probably fall apart in looking for things that we recognized already as patterns of communication. So yeah, I'm just adding to your... That AI is trained on such um, human-centric agendas. Yeah. Sense and disentangle Touch and re-entangle Sense and disentangle Sense and disentangle Touch, touch, touch Touch and re-entangle Multidimensional ecologies Poised in fragile equilibria, a speculative cosmology of atmospheres, atmospheres without space, without space. I am interested in how we might explore a world that has been newly connected. Because today, the world, and much within it, takes part in a multiplicity of movements. Now, we have a myriad of foundation models, assisting us with everything from generation to classification tasks. We have GBT, we have CLIP, we have stable diffusion, but no doubt there will be more and better ones soon. CLIP stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training and is a model trained to work with both images and text. Everything that reads or sees is assigned a very precise place within the hyperdimensional embedding space that it hosts, a space that lies well beyond human comprehension, let alone experience. Each term, each stream of text, each image, each array of pixels can be embedded into the 512 dimensions of the resulting hyperdimensional vectors 
do not mean anything to us, but they are operative. They do work, and they do so impressively well. Handy's momentary constellations tell us something about the world that they embed, and Mikey's models not only embed, but also actively shape the world around us. Now, what is quite exciting to think about is that the world clearly has no problem at all, at least mathematically, to host um, way more dimensions than the three dimensions that we know uh, from our three-dimensional planetary sphere that we currently inhabit or the space that we take up in this three-dimensional room. But this space, this 512-dimensional space of clip, where images and text converge, is a space of features which are incredibly obscure to us. Like, we might be able to probe into a specific uh, feature and try to find out something about it, but largely um, it kind of withdraws from our full comprehension. And maybe this is not completely surprising because as many other recent innovations, when it came to AI, the algorithms used to train these models belong largely to a family called unsupervised machine learning. Which means that we cannot just open these models up and then understand what's going on inside them. Now, in the case of Clip, and you can see the embeddings at the, at the ceiling, by the way. In the case of Clip, we are dealing with images and text, which are just not any kind of images and text, but they are captions and images on the web. So there is some sort of uh, pre-established relationship there. But the cool thing about unsupervised learning is that like, we don't have to understand what kind of rules might govern these translations, or we don't need to formulate the rules for, for this at all, but we let the machine do its thing. Of course, now this begs a couple of questions, because if you are already struggling to understand the models that were trained on our own way of writing and talking about the world or depicting or imaging it, how on earth should we be able to make sense, and I think this goes to your uh, point, Maggie, or understand the world any better if we train it, let's say, on, on bird song or whale song? But then maybe, uh, Felix, you, you have some more to say about this. Yeah, the fact that we don't understand these complex models leads in my view, to a certain mystification and to an exaggerated, almost religious hope of finally being able to, you know, make sense of the world and we can get the trees and the whales and the birds to speak to us suddenly. And I think this is a really dangerous uh, idea because it's an idea of rendering the world transparent, rendering the world accessible. And I think we really need to find ways of respecting things that we don't understand, and not just that we temporarily don't understand, but that we know they are beyond our own embodied ways of understanding the world. Absolutely, but I think, I think there's also another counter, there's a, the, the complicated position on that as well, and in the sense that any sort of machine learning system or AI system is also a model of what we think intelligence is, right? And the interesting thing for me, at least, as someone interested in theories of modeling and so on, is that it gives us an externalization to then tinker with. And what we're seeing is actually this development of machinic intelligence, as problematic as and exciting as it can be, it's all those things. It's actually exploding philosophically the category of what we think intelligence is and sort of unsettling this perceived monopoly that uh, you know, so-called uh, man, and it was a man indeed, was supposed to have upon intelligence. So perhaps I will leave that and hand it over to Daniela, because I know you're also invested in models uh, with regards to governance, for example. Yes, that is true, and I fully, I fully agree with you. And um, you, I think you brought up a very interesting point because, on the one hand, philosophically, there was long this idea of the superiority, superiority of human thinking, and how computers are kind of similarities and and a testimony to human success. And now, um, there is also a lot of 
fear and a lot of concern coming with the fact that something might um, exceed uh, human capacities. I think it is uh, just super, super important to provide these technologies, to provide broad access and education on these technologies, because at the end of the day, they are far more than just computational power. They're networks of economic and political interest, flows of matter, energy, but also potential and creativity. a spirit. I'm connected to the earth. I'm not a extractionist. I'm not a bot. During a workshop break in the smoking corner, Amandine, the head of the Department of Global Deforestation and its impact on climate and societal change, told us that the simulation models were simply too big and too coarse. A certain tree will only show certain characteristics in a very small territory under very specific local conditions in relation to a very specific set of other agents in close proximity. We would have to plaster the entire planet with sensors to receive workable results, a task that would take much more time than we have. Her department had just published an article in Nature stating that climate research had entered a new phase under what she called the planetary post-simulation condition. I inquired why, if there was no hope for the future, they were still collecting all this data. Um, you see, uh, Amandine answered in a spectacularly fake British accent, we are collecting as much data as possible for a time in which tech will have evolved to a level that it can bring back what has been lost. For this, we collect as much information as we can about the conditions under which all those extinct organisms, dead creatures and disappearing plants once existed. We're no longer that interested in a future we do not have anyway, but more in a past we can recreate. That's why we need the data. It's a big shift in our whole approach, and because we know that climate change will not suddenly stop, that there will be no stability, the best chance we have is to minimize the average reconstruction time between ecological change and our reaction to it. With simulation models, we simply bet on a dead horse that we named the future. Now, we're hoping that one day we can revive this horse again and again, if necessary. So I guess there is an interesting anecdote to the post-simulation condition in, in regards to the rewilded bird, that is a rewilded migratory bird. So the scientists actually, uh, when they made the first simulations of you know, what kind of habitat the migratory bird lives at, they were calculating that it's basically migrating from Central Europe to Italy and flying over the Alps. And just within the last 10 years, actually, um, the climatic conditions changed so much that the birds fly later and later in autumn, which means also that they are missing the thermal winds that actually bring them over the Alps. So we see in a very short time frame, you know, um, the models already need to adapt because actually there was a parameter inside of the simulation that was not at all calculated in and not at all factored in. Which brings up the question actually, you know, are we still able to create um, simulation models or are we only able to observe the derivations of them? Yeah, it's an interesting question, a great way to tie in Thomas's work as well, because what it seems to me is that the way you're describing it, the model has to presuppose a certain condition of stability, which exactly the sort of condition that Thomas's work uh, critiques, right, is this kind of presupposition of, of uh, or this ontology of stability that we've been working with in, let's say, the Holocene period. Oh, how would you respond to that, um, Thomas, with this kind of, how to bring in this dynamism or this kind of 
presupposition of movement um, within the practice of modeling itself, perhaps? Yeah, it's, that's a really great, challenging question um, in modeling specifically, because at a certain level, I wonder if there's something about artificial intelligence and modeling itself that can't help but start with an assumption of stability or an assumption of some kind. And so maybe it's not a question of uh, an assumption list or, you know, maybe we must start somewhere, but the question is how to kind of get out from underneath that somewhere as quick as we can, um, sort of heading and tracking experimentally, you know, the unknown um, to be open to what is, uh, what is definitely certainly going to change. I'm not sure if artificial intelligence is prepared to, or if modeling itself is prepared to sort of undo its own metaphysics of of modeling in that way, and it's always going to be surprised. And perhaps then, maybe there's a real limit to, uh, you know, an experimental limit, um, but still maybe a fundamental limit to the entire approach um, that would be quite different. For instance, in let's just say uh, predictions or simul non-virtual simulations by you know, indigenous people who live someplace for a very long time have a pretty good sense of what's going to happen next, but it's not, it's a totally different way of doing it than a model. I saw you I nodding and shaking this, your head, Juliana. Yeah. I think this absolutely ties in with a very problematic leap that humanity, Western, Western humanity took in um, shifting from the question who and where to how and why. So from natural history to ecology um, and in that leap of modeling where and why, we left out the question of who and where. And, and this poses an extremely problematic um, reality for how we're looking at planetary challenges at the moment. We have entire models of rewilding built on, um, or for example, what happened with the migratory birds built on dates, but we're not looking at the particularities of who and where. On that profound quest in the fabric of the cosmos, we see, we, we test minds, trees, and deep with thoughts mingle and twine of breathing. Experimental fiction operating through multisensory imagination, exploring ways of expanding and inhabiting alien systems of perception and proprioception. A call to Western human centric perspectives to embrace knowledge gathering through embodied intelligence, 
and to consider how AI might be trained on the decentralized somatic tendencies of the octopus as a distributed, many-minded consciousness enmeshed in a fluid, complex and fluctuating environment, rather than on current corporate marketing surveillance agendas, an expression of hope for the contemporary world, though not necessarily human. Yeah, I just want to add something to the question of hope, indeed. We live in dark times, and in former times, very often people looked up into the sky at birds as signs of hope, because they were so much freer than we were. I want to stress that hope, for me, is a decision. Hope is a practice, and hope cannot survive alone. It needs a whole ecosystem of virtues that we need to cultivate. May it be pa patience, may it be generosity, and let's not forget a strategic mind. That's brilliant. Yes, and also maybe I'd add... Um, Cohabitation. Compassion and letting go of feeling like we have to stay the centre of certainty and... Um, what what guy what uh, dictates? Well, no, I don't like that word. What um oh uh, gathers what needs to be changed? Like it might not be things we understand, and I it's really hard to stand back from that. Like many of you are talking about this the planetariness that Pat Patricia started with. That basically we're the history we have. Well, the sense, the narrative of being what being human is for the Western mindset is just completely uh, redundant now. Yeah. Without sort of the acknowledgement of the metabolic interaction between both human affairs, the physical, the biological, the chemical, the uh, the uh, geological, right, and some may even say the astrobiological, without understanding that metabolic sort of multi-scalar interaction. Um, we, we, have, we have a very impoverished picture of what history is, right? So the planetary is a kind of synthesis of all of these various forces understood as having their own particular forms of agency. So moving away from this sort of impoverished picture of history that we're all sort of trying to work through in various ways, I think it may be important to stress that we should maybe undo some of these dichotomies that we've been working with, like the map versus the territory, the representation versus reality, uh, you know, the generality versus the particularity, and rather ask the question, what is the metabolic interaction between these forms, which sort of assumes a, a synthetic view um, that is basically a synthesis between the conceptual and the material as sort of non-oppositional, but, non but nonetheless operational entities. I agree. At the same time, I'd like to insist on a very old-fashioned term now, which is fiction. Because, you know, like we talked about fabulation before, and fabulation ties in with a lot of what you've said. But maybe in high times of synthesis and simulation and processes, the old-fashioned uh, practice of fiction with its insistence on not being real um, is uh, a form of... Uh, a form of resistance that we do need. But maybe that thought goes into a wrong direction and I'd like to pass it back to Thomas. Thanks. I, I don't know about universalizing uh, fiction, um, but I do think that Patricia is right that the binaries uh, are sometimes you just never find your way out of them. Um, I've tried to think of things with other concepts, others have too. I think it's worth trying to invent new words to um, yeah, describe, in many ways, very old things. But um, some of the words that I like to think about instead of binaries are flows, folds, patterns, fields, fields and fabrics. I find these to be helpful images to think about um, things with uh, as opposed to real versus not real, fiction versus non-fiction. Uh, you know, what are things doing? How are they moving? Um, and give our, give our best kind of engaged, ongoing descriptions of 
what's going on, how we're involved, and uh, realize that that's it's just not a it's not a complete process that we're going to get objective closure on. But there's lots of other words. What others think? I think the notion of of scales, particular when applied to metabolism, allows us to move out of a human centric framework because we realize we are in scales and in temporalities that are either too small or too rapid for us to see them unaided unmediated or are too large and too slow for us to understand them directly or experiencing them directly so we need forms of translation and these forms of translation can be technological but they can also be narrative. They can be fictional elements that allow us to see and to understand and to kind of have an effective relationship with something that is not present. I just want to add to that, that in this process of recomposing, it's important to decompose. And I want to bring to, to the surface also protest. Protest as a form of recomposition um, in, in light of creating new ways of thinking, new words. And it's important to be, uh, to protest and to fight for that right and demonstrate freely. After the break, I stayed behind for a moment, lost in the leftover coffee grounds in my cup. When I got drawn in by the deep humming of a small server room, one of those messy ones stacked to the roof with whirring circuits and ventilators, I put my head through the door and bathed in the brown noise for a moment. Looking at the blue, red, green, and yellow cables hanging from the stacks in swirls and curls, I sensed the gigantic, ever-processing archive of undead animals, beings, 
creatures, fungi, plants, all those species and organisms spooking around in potentiality, most of which I had never met or even known about when they were still alive. Feeling the electric presence of a world past, I understood, well, I actually felt that Amandine was right. I put my plugs in, scrolled through Spotify, and chose a song that had been top of the charts in the 1960s. It had just re-emerged 65 years later when it became the soundtrack for a popular series. A warm feeling tingled in me. I thought of my mum who had died an alcoholic years ago. The lamps beeping and the cables twirling like locks or colorful seaweed connecting all those creatures living and dead in eternal co-presence, I stepped inside the archive that has become the world. Pleased to meet you, all you ghosts from the present, future, past. Manage care withdrawal. 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 Manage care Gerald Nestle und Sylvia Kammern. Danke an alle Mitwirken. Äh, ist das Mike da? Okay. Danke an alle Mitwirken, danke an alle Besucher. Ohne euch macht das keinen Spaß, sozusagen. <lacht> Wie ist man von den Proben? Äh, das hat wunderbar geklappt für uns. Ich hoffe, es hat euch gefallen. Danke ans Donau Festival, das großartige Team vom Donau Festival und alle, die beteiligt waren. Merci, danke. Applaus